Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here again with Jane Friedman. Hi Jane. Hello Joanna, great to be back. Yes, third time on the show. I think I think you're actually the first person to come back for the third time, which is just amazing. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, but just in case anyone missed the previous episodes, um, Jane has over 15 years experience in the book and magazine publishing industry with expertise in digital media and the future of authorship. She teaches publishing at the University of Virginia and is an international speaker and author. So Jane, we're going to skip over all your wonderful accomplishments and go dive straight into it today because you just did a brilliant blog post on what authors should be watching out for in 2016 and we're going to go into some of those things but let's start with mobile um so talk a bit about why mobile is important and what authors should be doing well, if you look at all of the internet trends as far as how people are accessing the internet, more and more it's on mobile devices. And of course, if you look globally, a lot of people are kind of like skipping over some interim steps that the West, uh, Western countries experienced, and they're like going straight to mobile devices for all sorts of reading and entertainment. So where you see a lot of growth is not, let's say, in um, desktop reading or laptop reading or e-reading devices, but mobile reading. And there was an excellent article in the Wall Street Journal, which I point to in my trend roundup, talking about uh, what the shift might mean, how publishers are changing their marketing strategies to make sure that um, when people are looking at their mobile device and come across a new book, they have ways to immediately access that book and read it while they're on their commute or whatever it is that they're doing on the move. Mm. So let's just go into that a bit deeper. So, uh, for you know, which are the platforms that are most likely to benefit from this shift to mobile? Well, there are very specific sites and social media networks that we all use. Um, you know, for years now, Facebook has seen a growing trend of more people accessing it through a mobile device than through the desktop. It passed the 50% mark some time ago. Uh, also, if you look at people who are reading ebooks, more and more of them are actually reading them on tablets and mobile devices. So that then affects uh, how people read their Kindle books. It might be on an iPhone, for instance, or an iPad. Um, iBooks, of course, has a, a huge advantage because it's pre-installed into tablets and, and iPhones. And so people might go through that portal first if, if they haven't been active ebook readers already through the Kindle. And uh, Twitter, to some extent, although we can touch on that later about some of its mixed fortunes. Um, Apple has also put out a news app to try and capitalize on more news access uh, through app apps and mobile devices. So, you know, the, it's it still feels a little bit like maybe dark ages, and there's also like a bigger picture battle that tends to happen between whether we're accessing news, reading, and information through an app on our mobile device or whether it's through a browser. So I don't know that those types of concerns need to be a front and center for an author. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting to keep your eye on whether reading tends to be more app driven or just more mobile driven in general. But it's it's mobile all day, all the time, regardless. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because I was thinking about this and I read on my phone and I read, I, I have an iPhone, which now has iBooks come as standard in the device, which it didn't originally. Um, and with Kindle, you can't buy uh, Kindle books within the app because of Apple's in-app purchase rules, I presume, which would mean Apple would get a cut of all the sales. Right. So, so you can only add a Kindle book to your wish list or you have to go through the browser. Now, I, I was thinking, you know, as you were talking, I'm like, I never, well, no, I use the browser for search. It'd be like, what time is the cafe open down the yeah. road? But I wouldn't, I still don't use, um, I wouldn't use the Amazon site through the browser to go and buy a book. So mm -hmm. that that's, I that makes me wonder about the global market in terms of Apple. Are we going to see a bigger rise in those places uh, where the Apple devices are more dominant? It's possible, uh, certainly for those people who have not yet made any kind of investment in a specific platform. Mm. So like speaking for myself and for my partner, um, we both kind of bought into the Kindle years ago because we bought an e-reading device. We, we both have a Kindle um, standalone device. And so it would be very difficult 
for us at this point um, to say we're going to switch over to iBooks, even though it would likely be more convenient, um, given what you just said. And I think what happens with people who've already kind of um, got their loyalty in one place, which you can see why Amazon had the strategy it did or it does um, to get you locked in to their platform. You know, I often make my purchases now, you know, when I'm at a desktop or on a laptop and it's not really an issue you know, to, to just buy it somewhere at some other time or point in my day. And then when I'm ready to read, I can just, it's already there waiting for me in the app. Yeah. And I mean, when I think of bookstores as well, I mean, I'm one of those terrible people of which there are many of us who go into bookstores a lot, you know, and I still buy books for gifts in bookstores, but I will often take a picture of book covers or I'll write down um, the name of a book I want to go and look at, and then I'll go get it on my Kindle. So do you, I mean, and in England at Waterstones, which is one of the big ones, they initially went with this kind of, if you log on through our Wi-Fi will get a percentage but that was just really hard and people weren't doing it uh, and of course now we have um, Amazon with a physical bookstore where I think you can check prices or something with your phone uh, as we do so are we going to see a change in physical bookstores related to mobile technology? I think you you could what's interesting from the United States based perspective is that the one retailer that was in a fabulous position to do that, Barnes & Noble, um, has not done it. Um, they had the Nook device, uh, but the Nook has just been really kind of in a downward spiral for quite some time now in terms of sales, and it, it's losing money. And Barnes & Noble never really kind of brought those two experiences together or found a way to integrate them. I, I can't speak to why, but it hasn't happened. And I don't think it's going to happen in the future. And right now in the United States, and I think there's similar things happening in the UK, if I, if I look at the trend pieces, everyone's kind of rallying around the so-called resurgence of prints and how, how well independent bookstores are doing. And the independent bookstores are just kind of now kind of strutting around a little bit, very proud of themselves. And they're, they are not tempted to try and integrate that experience. Um, and I think it would be very hard for them to do so. As I said, Barnes & Noble was in the best position. So, yeah, I don't – I really don't see anything happening in that sector f for a very long time. Yeah. Although I, I would love that there is um, a company called Bitlet. I'm trying to remember if they changed their name recently. But uh, their their appeal is that they can provide you with an ebook copy – of your print book if the publisher has agreed for that transaction to take place, whether for free or for, for some amount of money. And of course, Amazon offers that through Matchbook. And I, th I wish there were more of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in the music industry, we've already seen how that uh, has worked successfully. So if you buy, for instance, the LP or the um, uh, you, you don't have to say that, oh, well, I'm not going to get the digital version because it's going to cost, you know, double, I'm, um, you get a code that allows you to download uh, mm. the digital files because you bought the physical media. So I wish there were more of that happening on the book industry side. But it seems incredible that we're still talking about that now. I mean, isn't it just crazy? It's so behind. I was saying to someone the other day about the Future Book Conference, you know, it's kind of, to me, it's like what happened three years ago <laughs> is what they cover. Yeah. So, you know, which is funny because, yeah. you know, mobile is one of the things that people are talking about. And it's like, yeah, we've been reading on our phones for years. And what's interesting is now the international side. But just back on the phone, because there's so many things for us to talk about. But back on the phone, Google Android, of course, is a big, um, well, it's a big competitor. And also a lot of the early adopters, a lot of it's cheaper phone, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's open source. Uh, uh, it doesn't have that in-app purchase thing. I don't think it does anyway. Um, now, Google Books this year, like what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, if people don't know, they stop taking new publishers. So you can't self-publish direct on Google Books right now. Uh, you can go through a um, distributor, some like Publish Direct, for example, I think is one. Um, but essentially, uh, nothing you know seems to be happening there. What What are your thoughts yeah. on Google, Google Books, and mobile as well? 
I I have so little insight into what they might do in the future, and I do, and so they've almost become a non-entity to me when I think specifically about independent publishing. I mean, I think you know as well as I do, they represent such a minuscule percentage of ebook sales, and it would be very hard for them now to try and compete on the level that Amazon or or Apple is competing, uh, and. So you, but it's not to say that Google's not important. I just, for now, like for the foreseeable future, when I think about them, I'm thinking about how how authors can use them to ensure that their books or their name come up in relevant searches, uh, so that when you're looking for the next great book you want to read, that was like um, Girl on the Train <laughs> or Fifty Shades of Grey, um, that that somehow what you do in your work can be connected um, as um, there's a specific term I'm looking for. I think I've lost it. Uh, lookalike audiences. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, that's just a term in when we look at online marketing and we can talk about this as it applies to Facebook advertising as well, where you know that your audience has a lot in common with this other author's audience. And you can use Google's tools and analytics and keyword searches and keyword trends to figure out some of the finer points of that to be more effective with how you build your site, what keywords you use in your advertising, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, of course, they did acquire uh, Oyster. Oyster, yeah. And so they're probably doing something interesting, but I always think of Google in terms of like really like blue sky, big picture initiatives. Self-driving you know? cars, space, exactly. Google yeah. Loon. <laughs> they're out there like looking 10, 50, 100 years ahead. And so I feel mm-hmm. like the things that concern authors on a practical day-to-day level, Google is not even like... They don't even have time to glance. <laughs> yeah, and but it's funny, like we say, you say that, and of course that's true. And Google Loon, if people don't know, is one of the initiatives that is looking to bring streaming internet to every person on the planet, um, along with Facebook, Qualcomm, Virgin, a whole load of other companies. You know, I think they're saying before 2019 or something. So like in the oh, next, wow. yeah, it's really amazing. So basically to put cheap mobile and streaming internet at, I think, 4G speed to every person on earth through balloons and through all this other stuff and to me that like you're saying that's probably where we're going to see the impact of google is in making the rest of the planet aware even of this right. type of stuff so that's yes, really cool yes. but um we'd be remiss if we didn't mention kobo and i was looking at a roundup of the year i don't know if it was yours but it was looking at rakuten rakuten who own kobo also bought overdrive which is the library ebook and audiobook system like yes. back in march or something and it, it missed my radar until i looked back at the year um you know, would do you? Uh, and, and we're talking entirely, you know, our own thoughts. Would Rakuten buy Nook, for example? I mean, they just took oh. Flipkart, didn't they? They took Flipkart in India, uh, mm-hmm. has gone to mm-hmm. Kobo. So, uh, you know, what what do you see happening there? Any anything interesting with Kobo or comment? Um, well, Kobo is an international company. is is fascinating, and. Uh, but I, I think I don't have much of a, a crystal ball insight there as to what, whether they would be interested in Nook. My first gut reaction is no, because I don't know that they offer any advantage unless there's some customer data there that would be useful to At them. Least. Yeah, exactly. Um, when so who was it that acquired Sony? Yeah, they also went. To, they, yeah, they didn't get acquired. They just their customer database went to Kobo, as did Flipkart. Right. So I could I could see something like that happening. Yeah. Um, more data is great, obviously for for these companies, especially if they're if they're if they don't have much U.S. data. And f- from everything I can tell on the outside, they don't have as good market penetration in the U.S. as they do elsewhere. Mm, yeah, and I'm excited. I just did my I do my Nook report, and I've sold books. Uh, sorry, not Nook, Kobo. Uh, sold in 72 countries now through Kobo. Actual sell, sold books, which is super exciting. You know, as we talk about all this type of stuff. Uh, and then talking of lists and the power of lists, uh, there's been a few people saying that BookBub might uh, get acquired this year because they did another funding round. Uh, yes. They've gone international. They have like. I don't know, millions of names now of readers. Yeah, millions. <laughs> so again, yeah. this is crystal ball-y, you know, opinion. Will they get bought by a traditional publisher like the people who just bought that, the midlist? Right, yes, um, that was HarperCollins, Harper- I think. Yeah, it was, in, it was one of the big companies and we all lost, immediately lost in other marketing. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you think will happen with BookBub this year? Well, it, 
I maybe they will be acquired, but for some reason, I don't think it'll be a traditional publisher. I'm more inclined to believe it'll be Amazon or um, someone like Amazon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> someone like Amazon. Um, who would that be? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, it, but it's interesting isn't it it's a data play the whole thing is a data play and and a list play and you know I keep coming back to that from an author perspective you know you you're so across everything in the industry is it still just a case of writing books and building up a customer list yes <laughs> is that too simplistic <laughs> it's simple but it's not easy <laughs> right right simple but not easy I would agree <laughs> but it's yeah. funny that way um anyway back to your um stuff so back to the traditional publishing industry and that print all the print journalism that went on this year uh, uh why are the traditional publishing industry and the media and the press ignoring the shadow industry figures well I think it's easy for them to dismiss it because they're not seeing the numbers in book scan many times, uh, except for really standout titles. Um, I, I know that you and others have also mentioned the ISBN issue, you know, that, you know, the traditional publishers are going to pay attention to the traditional metrics that they've always worked by. So out of sight, out of mind, if it's not popping up as taking like, you know, concrete taking away market share. And I think that, whatever aspect of that falls under Amazon too, I think they're likely to think, oh, well, that's just, that's just Amazon. So that's, and I don't think that this is right or appropriate, but they're, they still think, and to some extent rightly so, that a lot of the most important market and sales and a lot of their profits are happening through the bookstore market. And you don't find a whole lot of self-publishing sales activity in that traditional bookstore market. Mm. So uh, as we said, um, I mean, the other thing is on that global thing, I've seen, you know, rumblings that they're looking to change territories. You know, at the moment, I feel like we, the indies have got a big advantage in global markets because most traditional publishers focus very much on very small silos, whereas we just go, yay, everywhere, 170 countries or whatever. Yeah. So, um, but I've kind of seen that that might be changing as well. Do you, do you see them changing their attitude on that? I think some publishers would like to do more worldwide releases where and simultaneous or a, as close to the same launch date as possible. This was discussed a little bit at Nink, the novelists uh, conference for, for people who've published more than two books. This was a really hot topic there. But what you find once you start scratching the surface of that is even though there are some really great stories of having a worldwide laydown date, like for The Secret. I think that was mm. one example that was that came up at Nick. You know, very few publishers have that kind of um, capability where they would have all of the different um, footprints in the countries that are necessary, or even all of the necessary resources and investment. Like it Obviously, it costs a lot of money to be able to do that, and you have to have a reasonable level of confidence. And most publishers aren't going to make to make that investment upfront before they have some kind of, you know, evidence mm. that it's going to pay off. And uh, yet, as you say that, uh, you know, we've seen the Authors Guild uh, pointing out the terrible contracts that are being offered to authors, where even though, as you say, they're not going to publish it worldwide, um, they're asking for World right. English and a whole load of other things. So uh, it, from what I've heard from authors who are traditionally published, the contracts are getting worse. Um, is this something that you, you, you've you seen and, and, and why is it happening yeah. that way? Yeah, isn't it funny that <laughs> publishers want to, you know, they want worldwide English or worldwide period, um, but they're not doing these releases that take advantage of having those rights in mm -hmm. the first place. But it's true. I mean, the contracts are very rights grabby, and sometimes it's justified. Um, and, and many times it's not. And any book that's agented in, in most cases, the publisher isn't going to get what they want in the boilerplate. But certainly... Um, for authors that have become global brands, it's not necessarily a bad thing for the publisher to have all of those rights under one umbrella because it, it just makes it easier to do a worldwide release and brand marketing. So, I, you know, it, it, it's such a case by case um, situation of mm -hmm. whether or not it's a good thing for the author um, to be signing away those rights. 
and some of it's about about you know how much money they're getting paid the trust the the history and relationship between that author and the publisher and and what the agent themselves can do uh, Mm. with those rights and I mean again you're across both sides of the industry and you go to a lot of conferences have you seen a change in the power dynamic I guess between authors agents traditional publishing are authors more empowered now than five years ago I want to say yes (laughs) <laughs> but I'm worried that it's wishful thinking. <laughs> no, me too. I'm like, hell yeah, but maybe not. <laughs> um, I, I think that for authors who have been able to reach their audience in some way, apart from a reliance on a publisher, I do think those people are more empowered. Unfortunately, I think it's a small segment of the author population that has been entrepreneurial in the same way that many independent authors have been, where they have they have the power and the ground to stand on if they walk away and that they're not afraid to to venture out on their own. And you've seen, you know, some isolated cases of that happening with some well-established authors. Um, but there are some authors, even if they were able to reach their audience directly, Stephen King is like the example everyone loves to bandy about um, because he did kind of go out on his own once or twice um, with some success. But all, at the end of the day, he's like, I don't, I don't want to bother with that. <laughs> I, mm. you know, I don't want the money that badly. I don't want the control that badly. Um, and I'm sure he's got a really good deal with his publisher. Exactly. So, yeah. So the, there, there is a class of author who I think is more empowered. But I don't think like the emerging writer, the new, the person without any credits to their name, are they more empowered? Mm, not necessarily, but there are lots more options and paths for them if they educate themselves. But in that first book contract, if they choose traditional, it's hard. It's as hard as it's ever been. Mm. And let's uh, talk about audio because uh, this holiday, I, I mean, I've had got audio books on Audible um, and iTunes. And of course, I've been podcasting for years. But finally, <laughs> this Christmas, I fell for Audible's, um, you know, monthly recurring payment. And I've been listening to a lot more. And my husband got the double one. He's really into it. And it's gamified. I didn't even know this until the last few weeks. You get badges for how much you listen. And he's like, hey, look, I just got another badge. And I'm like, whoa, that is... <laughs> Is crazy. Like, why aren't yeah. we gamifying ebook reading for a start? But two, uh, what is happening with audio? Because you mention it in your post as well. Uh, last yeah. year, I started off like, yay, audio is amazing. And then the royalties changed, the offers changed and made it much harder to get royalty split deals because of the discounting. Right. Uh, but uh, again, with the mobile, you know, it's so easy to get audio, um, whisper sync, etc. What's going to happen this year with with audio? I, I don't see a huge strategic change for anyone. I just see increased interest and increased growth. Um, in 2014, the biggest growth area for traditional publishers was audio. And I would argue that if for any independent author also moving into that area, it was huge mm-hmm. for their growth. Uh, John Scalzi did a beautiful post uh, about the importance of audio to a new release that he had started to wake up if you hadn't been awake already to what audio means because there are some people who that's that's you know how they how consume they books mm. yeah so the other interesting post that came down the pike was um, a, unfortunately a misleading article about how audiobooks were outselling print which is true in some isolated cases but you're also looking at uh, audiobooks that are narrated by highly desirable talent. So whether that's celebrities or really high quality productions that bring together an ensemble cast. So they're becoming like major productions for some types of books. Um, so in in that sense, I think we're going to see more elaborate uh, productions, especially with authors where you can see, like John Scalzi, this is a person who is going to be selling as many audiobooks as they are print uh, for uh, during a certain window of time. Mm. D- didn't Scalzi so- sign like a 10-year massive deal he did. that basically <laughs> takes everything for the rest of his life? <laughs> More or less, yes. <laughs> yeah, and that, and and again, like you said, in a case where an an author, and I would say, I mean, he is he's in the, he wouldn't be a list, but he'd certainly be he'd be up there, you know, in terms of the that how he would be treated, and you know, it's interesting, you know, for those authors who started out 
traditional and have reached uh, you know a really high level it makes sense to leave all that with a publisher and actually audio would be one of those things uh, I'm interested in selling audio rights because of the high quality that these companies can do um, and selling foreign rights I think as well because uh, self-publishing and translation is a pain in the neck I mean it's yeah. seriously so much work um, so that's interesting so but back on all audio um, I wanted to mention you know this year Google Auto and Apple CarPlay um, will bring streaming audio into cars uh, all newly manufactured cars will have their mm -hmm. streaming uh, internet so podcasting and audiobooks I think will that will really affect it probably not this year but next year and of course both Google and Apple are working on drive cars right so whether yes. that's again two years five years by the time they sort out the legalities um but people will need something to do when they're in the driverless cars indeed indeed they will and i i think that it also points to just you know, how much more growth is yet to come mm. and there was a great study in the u.s i don't know what the equivalent would be in the uk or europe but that 50 percent of the u.s market hasn't heard of the term podcast <laughs> So when you, th it's kind of like, what's going on there? Like we had this huge phenomenon uh, in 2014 of the podcast serial, mm. and, which has just now gone into its second season. So some some part of me wonders if people know about serial, but they're thinking radio show yeah. rather than podcast. And so there's, I think people are still kind of figuring out the universe of podcasts and what's available. And it, it struck me a few months ago as I was searching for podcasts to listen to that there, it's actually really hard mm -hmm. to search for podcasts mm -hmm. by episode or topic or like to go back into an archive of all the available podcasts. Impossible. Um, so it's, yeah. there's not like a Google for, for podcasts. For podcasting. And there are now networks springing up. So copy blogger um, Rainmaker.fm now has one. Um, the boys at SPP have just started um, uh -huh. a, 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 a podcast network. So then you at least get multiple podcasts from similar creators. Right. Um, but as you're saying that, I'm thinking... I still get emails, you probably do as well, which says, should an author have a blog or a website? In that, <laughs> yeah, and, and we both laugh because we've both, both been doing this for so long, but not without understanding that a blog is a website or a website can have a blog. And I think the word blog and the word podcast come from an earlier stage of technology, yeah. like weblog. Nobody uses that anymore. Maybe we shouldn't yeah. use blog anymore because my site's not a blog and yours isn't either, although you have a, a blog tab don't you and, and I so do, do I. I mean it probably could be news or updates or articles rather than than blog so I think maybe podcast is the same because it comes from iPod right yes yes and how many people don't use an iPod anymore but they just use a phone oh gosh <laughs> oh, most people I would say at this point <laughs> Yeah. So it could be a phone cast or a car cast or I don't know. But like you say, I think that we're missing the vocabulary. I mean, even ebook, ebook, you know, could get confusing. Yeah, I agree. I agree. A lot of people use the term ebook for what a, basically a PDF. Yeah, uh, which is crazy. Um, but just as you were talking there, um, Microsoft uh, announced 2016 as the year of AI. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of AI, like my husband just got the latest iPhone and he's there chatting away to Siri, you know, we've got little AI. Um, uh, but we're talking, you know, Amazon are looking at AI for their review stuff. We saw that last year. Um, and what I'm thinking of is the discoverability, like you're saying, um, we should have, well, Microsoft owns Skype, right? So we could Skype in different languages now. Um, and they have a translator, that's like an AI. And yeah. I'm what I want, this is my want list, is a <laughs> discoverability engine, an AI discoverability engine that indexes the content of a book. So I don't have to choose seven keywords and categories. It's ridiculous. Don't you think with a book, why are we having to choose this type of thing when AIs could use uh, emotion analysis, you know, all this type mm -hmm. of thing to work it out? So do you see, what impact do you see AI big data happening? Yeah, everything you said, I think, points to there being more powerful tools, more powerful AI to help authors with these decisions. And there's there's a site that's like starting to get at this just a little bit. Maybe you've seen it. It's called Find My Audience. Hmm. 
And so what it starts to do is you, you tell it, okay, my book is like this, or I'm an author who's like this one over here. And it tries to use data that's publicly available to try and tell you who your audience is and what your keywords are. And I think it's still quite primitive. But I think that when once it gets more powerful, it'll be fascinating to see how that tool develops in, in the next year or two years, because I think that's where we're all headed for sure. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the uh, amusingly, and we'll talk about uh, Porter Anderson in a minute, but you know, he's going on about the tsunami of books and how there's way too many books and all that. But we, with the growth globally, we're looking not just at being markets for selling books, we're looking at more authors in all mm-hmm. of these markets. There will be more authors, more books, more podcasts, more everything. So we yeah. have to, we have to get these better discoverability, you know, which is a terrible word, um, engine. But like for you to look for podcasts and me too, like, and that's mm-hmm. why I went to audiobooks because I got to the point of going, uh, you know, I'm just going to move on to audiobooks because it's easier to find audiobook content than it is to find podcast content, um, which is kind of crazy. But OK, so moving on. So um, I mentioned Porter Anderson. Of course, you guys have this thing called the hot sheet, which mm-hmm. uh, tell us about the hot sheet and, and what that's about. Yeah, so probably the best place to start is to talk about a newsletter known as Publisher's Lunch, uh, which is out of the United States. And it's part of a larger service called Publisher's Marketplace. It's been around for nearly 15 years, if not longer. It's by Michael Cater, who's an industry insider. And it's it's called the Industry Newsletter for Publishing Professionals or something like that. It goes to 40,000 people. I've been a religious subscriber, you know, my entire career. It's fabulous. I often recommend it to authors, but ultimately it's it's too insidery, it's too in the weeds. Um, authors aren't getting a lot of information that's particularly relevant to their careers. So, you know, off and on, I would do trend pieces like the one that we, we mentioned earlier, or I would do link roundups of stories that I felt were relevant for authors. But, you know, to, to do it consistently um, is best for authors if they want to stay like if, if they want to understand how things are take, taking shape and what news is most uh, most going to affect their next steps for their for their release or for their backlist or for their next marketing plan, so the hot sheet is supposed to be kind of like a publisher's lunch, not as frequent. That goes out daily. This this goes out every two weeks. It's supposed to do the job of publisher's lunch for a professional audience of writers and authors who know that things are changing quickly. Mm -hmm. They don't want to have to be worried or anxious that they're not reading the right blogs or the right news articles or the right trend pieces. We're just going, we package it up. We select the events or the changes or the trends that we think are most worthy of paying attention to and try to offer some context background a little bit of analysis. We try to stay away from anything too like opinion driven. One of our taglines is no hype, no drama, because we're we're trying to like kind of shave away a lot of the um the headbutting mm-hmm. <laughs> that can come into play between different author groups and just present the information and what it means to different author groups and then you decide what steps you need to take. Mm. So so in a nutshell, that's what it is. Mm. And uh, so and where can people find that? It's at hotsheetpub.com. And it's just a landing page uh, that describes what the content is like. It links to a couple of sample issues and then it provides a place to get a free trial for a month. So you can try a couple issues for free and then it's $59 a year after that. So every two weeks. Mm. Um, Which is fantastic. And again, like as we mentioned with the AI and the discoverability, one job is curation. There is so much content out there that the hot sheet and other thing, you know, your blog, my blog, we are, we're curating um, the massive amount of information and trying to interpret interpret it and uh don't know about you but I kind of hope we're supplanted by an AI at some point because it's quite (laughs) a lot of work keeping up with everything (laughs) it is a lot of work indeed it is but we really enjoy it but then also going on to other things you're doing because you're a busy lady I mean uh when I was uh, looking for an audiobook I discovered great courses and lo and behold I discovered you have a great course on Audible so uh tell us about that because it's fascinating and why you did it Yeah, yeah. Uh, The Great Courses is basically an adult education company that takes a range of 
what are considered university education topics, puts them into like 12 or 24 lecture uh, units, and then delivers them in audio and video versions. And so the, the great courses, they've been around for 30 or 40 years. They recently got into more what we would call hobbyist areas. Mm. So um, arts, music, wine, <laughs> yoga, and writing. <laughs> so uh, it's been about a year and a half ago they approached me because they their polling or their surveying showed that a publishing course would do very well. A long process. It was more or less like writing and publishing a book mm. because I had to write all of the lectures in advance. It amounted to more than 100,000 words. And then I went to their studios and then we produced the entire lecture series in a two-week production period. And then they had three months to then, you know, get it out the door in a consumer format. So, yeah, it's they're a fascinating company in terms of um, the future of media. Like, it was just so fun to see them, their marketing and their distribution for these pieces of content and how they were thinking about, you know, how the content might be um, chunked up or put into like smaller modules um, down the road. So there were, there were just so many, for me being like a, a publishing nerd, uh, it was fun to see their approach uh, to the content. Yeah. And I mean, they they audio and video you said there yeah. I didn't know they were video because I just got it on audible and I'm listening to one on um I didn't actually get yours because of it. yours is on publishing right so yeah, you know all of that <laughs> I didn't want to listen to something on publishing on holiday but I'm listening to the apocalypse uh, a whole le- load of lectures on the apocalypse because oh it's, re- it's research you know yeah. I love that and uh, I did theology and you know I love I love all that stuff so it's really really fascinating but of course courses are one of the other trends that is going on right now and um you know i find it quite amusing because it seems like the author community has just discovered that right course, i mean it really does seem right. that way right um it although does. you and i met years ago and courses have been around a long time but why why do you think there has been this sudden tipping point uh because it's super interesting right it is i agree it's like like, like you said the world has woken up to the the potential the profits uh, of online education. And it's something that when I worked at Writer's Digest in the 2000s, you know, this was a huge profit center for us. Uh, it was called, well, it's still called Writer's Online Workshops. And it, it evolved out of a correspondence course, like when people used to do courses through the mail. Oh, mail? And, What's that? That's on my right. phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I think one of the reasons uh, it's kind of had this uh, or its time has come or it's now very popular is that it's so much easier to do than it used to be. You have places like Udemy um, and other uh, places like teachable.com where you don't have to know anything about hosting videos or putting together a website. You just use you know the, these ready-made packages to put it together. And I think also the tools required to record audio or video or put together uh, curriculum, those are also now uh, pretty much available to anyone with a desktop or laptop computer. Mm -hmm. So if you go back, say, three years or five years, the the barrier to entry was so much higher. And now I think it's very affordable. It doesn't require much investment. Yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of like self-publishing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and that's what it is. So we're all teachers, we're all writers, you know. I And I really like that. And again, you know, in the same way with self-publishing, there's variable quality. Um, but everybody, you know, there's so many courses on so many cool things, uh, yeah. you know, which is just really brilliant. Um, now, I also, before we, and I could talk, talk to you for hours, you know that. <laughs> but I do want to come back to Twitter because we did mention that. And of course, you and I met on Twitter, I think it was over five years ago now, like... Um, um, when you had maybe like a hundred followers instead of two hundred thousand followers, <laughs> you, you're just like super Twitter. And of course, I love Twitter too. Um, as we mentioned, there are some problems with Twitter, mm-hmm. and and social media is changing so much. And I was talking yeah. to some uh, teenagers the other day, and they're like, they wouldn't go anywhere near it, you know. Um, and Facebook is obviously buying up places like Instagram and and doing and using Messenger as a kind of different platform and things. So they're kind of adapting. But what do you see? Mm-hmm changing with social media and also how you uh, how authors have to use it as in is it just pay to play 
Yeah. I mean, I think Facebook is more powerful than ever. I know lots of people talk about how teenagers or young people aren't using it, but I don't know that it really matters, mm. at least not yet. Not yet. Uh, uh, it's still more than a billion people on it. Facebook is also innovating uh, very well. They've got the instant articles feature. They're, they always seem to make changes, even if they you know, anger people in the short term. We, we all ultimately accept it. So I think f- being on Facebook, starting to become conversant with Facebook ads, if you aren't already, especially if you're a professional author, I think those are things that everyone's going to have to accept and, and educate themselves on if they haven't already. Twitter, I, I feel like it's still valuable, but it's maybe more of a take it or leave it. If, if you feel like you can't stand it, then there's no, there's no need for you to be there. Um, Twitter's made quite a number of changes in the last year. I'm a lot of the core users like myself are not that happy with mm-hmm. those changes, but I think it has to evolve because it's it's being left behind and it's not getting it's not retaining new users. It's not attracting a lot of new people. Uh, well, I don't know what its future will be. I think it will survive, mm-hmm. but I think it's it, it may end up just being a very specialized uh, niche community. I mean, news and journalism and media people rely on that so much and I think it will continue to be very important for current events and reporting but I, it's I don't think it can be a Facebook um, yeah no I so. agree and then I've mentioned before on the show that I think Facebook might get into publishing uh, as in they are publishing articles but in mm-hmm. in-app purchases as such um, oh yeah um, there are uh, I think there are apps within Facebook where you can link it to stores like sells uh, yeah. so you're essentially selling direct but do you see would you see Facebook setting up like a like a KDP like a, a publishing self-publishing platform where people can buy ebooks to read within Facebook I wouldn't rule it out um, I, I just see them doing more and more to uh, keep people in their environment, including mm. helping people search for information outside of Facebook within Facebook so that you never have to necessarily leave the cocoon. Uh, so maybe, I, I don't know that it will happen tomorrow, but clearly they have an interest in keeping content within its walls. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, we've covered so much and uh, it's all super exciting. Any last words on what authors should be doing in 2016 to essentially, you know, move with the times, I guess? (laughs) Um, I would say just about every author could stand to take another look at their website. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) uh, Think about how it's going to be more mobile friendly if it's Mm -hmm. not already. Um, Rethink the design. A lot of people are stuck with the designs from that are really more appropriate for five years ago, and it starts to show. So that would that would be my house cleaning task for everyone. Mm, that is a good one actually and uh, it's funny isn't it because I did a redesign I think two years ago and I think even the redesign before that you mentioned my redesign on your blog as as an example of finally she's finally made (laughs) (laughs) and now I'm like I really should be doing it again you know it's a kind of every two year thing I do I do think it's every two to three years Mm. Um, and certainly choosing the right theme that's flexible can ease the pain of any design updates you have to do yeah exactly um good okay so where can people find you and your blog and links to all of your stuff online Uh, i'm at janefriedman.com and really just about any social media account you might want to find me on it's jane friedman so twitter slash jane friedman facebook slash jane friedman yeah brilliant thanks so much for your time jane thank you a pleasure joanna